Okay, picking up. Part three, containment. Uh, Kennedy's inherited this plan to try and get rid of Castro, the socialist on his doorstep with the Bay of Pigs invasion. CIA trained, Cuban exiles are uh, sent back from America to try to overthrow Castro and start a general uprising of the people against him um, in April. There are over 1,400 of them. They are met by the full force of the Cuban military. Uh, over 20,000 Cubans rally to try and meet them on the beaches. And crucially, at the final hour, Kennedy calls off American air support. He's worried about the political fallout and how it will look in the eyes of the world. Um, and it's a complete disaster. In fact, Kennedy calls it a fiasco. A fiasco. And all of these uh, Cubans are either captured or killed, and most of them never get off the beaches. Uh, it's an inauspicious start to Kennedy's career. It um, leads on to uh, in June, very famously, he has a summit with Khrushchev, summit meeting where the leaders come together in Vienna, and Kennedy, um, you know, this very young president, very experienced president, comes out against the, the hardball Khrushchev who was there at Stalingrad in, in World War II and had been there and seen it all at Stalin's side during the early years of the Cold War. And he says, as he comes out of the meeting, he just beat the hell out of me. Could be a really, really good question on the consequences of the Bay of Pigs disaster. And you could talk about increased Soviet confidence and you could prove that really well with Castro's uh, treatment of Kennedy at the Vienna summit. And he thinks Kennedy's a weak president and he's maybe gonna try and force his hand uh, a little bit further. Um, but obviously you've got a very real threat of American invasion of Cuba and Castro is gonna to appeal to Khrushchev for even more support. So by the time you get to mid 62, because of this, you've got the biggest army in Latin America belonging to the Cubans because they're pumped up by Soviet military. Um, we'll give you one more thing for Vietnam in 62. I know it seems a bit out of the, um, the old sorry, it's April 63, that should say, should say 61. Um, that's mid 62. Okay, just jumping out into Vietnam in 62, you have the Americans following a strategic Hamlet policy. which is supposed to uh, eradicate the ability of the VC to control the civilian population. Uh, it goes down very, very badly with the Vietnamese peasants in South Vietnam as they're moved off ancestral land, they're put behind some barbed wire encampments um, and felt to, like they're prisoners and when the Americans are supposed to be there saving them. Um, and that's a policy that definitely backfires if you're trying to win the hearts and minds of the population in, in 62 in South Vietnam. Okay, Cuba now becomes the major focus for us in 62. This is, this is the crucial year. Um, by the time you get to September, you can see Khrushchev starting to flex his muscles. Kennedy warns him uh, not to make Cuba an offensive base, which he means you know, long range nuclear missiles. Um, and the Russians said they have no intention of doing that. Khrushchev says, in, this is September 62, just a month before the crisis. We have no intention of turning Cuba into a military base. We know that's not true. We know there are already missiles in Cuba by the time he says that in September. There are more on the way. Make sure you can answer, brilliant six mark question, why? Why did Khrushchev put missiles in Cuba? It was definitely going to escalate the Cold War. It could possibly bring about a nuclear war and the destruction of huge amounts of the population of the world. Why does he do it? There are multiple explanations about his confidence, about testing Kennedy, about how Kennedy appeared weak, about getting a bargaining chip. Make sure you can talk about the missile gap there. We haven't got time to go into those things on the timeline, but that's definitely an exercise you would have done in your um, study of the Cuban Missile Crisis that you need to be sharp on. Um, so we get to October. Uh, this is where it all kicks off. October the 14th. It's technically not the first day of the crisis because the president didn't know about it, but that's when the spy plane, I think you see it on the top right hand corner of your uh, sheet, we've got a U2. Oh, I think there is one on the sheet, but uh, clearly there's not one there. Um, that's when they take the pictures. They could, apparently, um, 
read the newspaper for 14 miles up. And it's making a routine reconnaissance flight over Cuba, and it finds, let's get geeky about this with some serious missile terminology, SS-4 missile sites over Cuba on the 14th. Um, in total, they work out there are 40 missiles at that time, but there are also 20 Soviet ships bringing more, um, plus 20 Soviet ships. These are medium range ballistic missiles. You'll see slightly different figures, but approximately 2,000 kilometers. Could hit every major American city on the eastern seaboard, uh, up as far as Washington, DC. So a major threat to the Americans, and um, they get the, these missiles are going to be ready in seven days. So this crisis needs to be dealt with, and it needs to be dealt with very, very quickly. Uh, once they're identified, I think it's later on the Sunday they're actually identified, that's when the pictures are taken. Kennedy is informed about it on Monday the 16th, first thing Monday morning, and he immediately puts his team of crack advisors together and he forms XCOM, the Executive Committee, to make a decision about what the hell they're going to do about this. It'd be great if you knew some of the people on that committee, his brother Bobby Kennedy, the Attorney General, General Maxwell Taylor, who was uh, chief, uh, joint chiefs, head of the joint chiefs of the military? Uh, McNamara, Secretary of Defence, people like that would be super if you, you know what they're arguing in that committee. That'd be top, top draw stuff. Um, and they, uh, they spend the next few days discussing what on earth they're going to do. In that time, on the 18th, there are more missiles discovered this time, longer range SS 5 missiles, up the geek factor. These ones are not medium range, these are intermediate range, IRBMs, intermediate range ballistic missiles. They have an approximately a 4,000 kilometer range. And now you're talking about every major American city except for Seattle, all the way up there in the Northwest, all except Seattle, within range of these missiles, Bobby Kennedy talked about 80 million Americans dying within 20 minutes. Make sure you guys could answer why are the Americans so worried about the missiles on Cuba? It seems like an obvious question. You need to be technical about it. You've got to talk about the detail of the missiles. You've got to talk about the threat. You've got to talk about first strike capability and understand nuclear warfare. Um, and the Americans having had the upper hand in the missile gap beforehand, and now the Cuban, uh, the Cuban missiles could be launched and it could take out their military bases, their nuclear bases, before they can retaliate. So that is a crucial thing to make sure we're aware of. So um, the decision is, is taken. Uh, I'll make sure also that you understand Kennedy options and that you can explain each one of his options and you can explain the pros and you can explain the cons of those options. The one he takes on the 22nd it's set up a quarantine, a blockade of Cuba. This is uh, uh, right in the middle in terms of how hawkish he could have been. He could have been softer, he could have been less provocative, he could have been way, way more aggressive in order to certainly an airstrike or even an invasion of Cuba to try and be really tough and get rid of those missiles. Um, this one here puts the ball in the Soviet court and is a brilliant example of what we call brinkmanship taking place but Kennedy is uh, making Khrushchev take the next move and see who's actually going to crack first under the pressure here um, if those Soviet ships had run the blockade we could have an act of war we could have a full scale nuclear war breaking out and it's a uh, one of the closest moments the world's ever come to that nuclear war on the 24th where just minutes from encountering that American blockade the Soviet ships do stop even though Khrushchev had said they weren't going to stop they either stop or they turn around, or they turn around, and that um, looks like the crisis is hopefully easing. However, at this stage, the preparation of the missiles on Cuba goes ahead, still being ready. So it has not removed, that's one of the problems with it as an option, it has not removed the missile threat from Cuba. Uh, they could be launched very shortly and Americans could still be killed in their millions. So um, the, the crisis is not yet over. On the 26th, 
in this 13 day crisis. Cracking film as well, 13 days, watch that if you haven't already. This is when Khrushchev sends his first letter. Call it, the best thing to do is call it the soft letter probably. Uh, it's quite an emotional letter. It appeals to Kennedy's uh, better nature and says, let's not tug too tightly on the knots of war. Um, and it offers missiles coming out of Cuba in exchange for a promise from Kennedy not to invade. We'll take the missiles out if we can guarantee Cuba's safety. It's good propaganda for the Soviet Union to have a beacon of communism in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, that's the first deal proposed. Looks like a decent deal. Whilst the um, ex con are debating this and talking about this, on the 27th, they get another letter. You might call that on the hard letter. Perhaps Khrushchev has a change of heart, they never really know. Perhaps some hardliners in the government have uh, kicked Khrushchev out. Again, the Americans just don't know this at the time because there was so little communication between the two, uh, the two sides. And this one tries a much tougher bargain and it says, we want your Jupiter missiles out of Turkey in exchange for the Cuban missiles. And that would be a humiliating climb down for the Americans and would not look good for the Kennedys. Um, whilst they're debating this, on the 27th, on the same day, the crisis escalates again. The only casualty in the crisis, a U-2 pilot is shot down, or a U-2 plane is shot down, and he is killed. Shot down by a surface-to-air missile. This is not a nuclear missile. It's one just designed to take out individual planes um, on Cuba, launched by a Russian crew, um, probably by some itchy trigger fingered local commander. Kennedy could have escalated the crisis here. He could have gone to full-scale nuclear war. He decides to do nothing in response. He doesn't bomb the sand site. Um, again, JFK's options and his response, you need to know. And this is potentially a good question about how effectively Kennedy handled the crisis, how effectively Khrushchev handled the crisis, how provocative each one was, how dangerous each one uh, conducted themselves. You've got really good material there to talk about Kennedy taking a, a safer path, even though perhaps he might have been provocative with the, the blockade in the first place. That one is not designed to do that at all, designed to avert a crisis, to de-escalate things. Um, so with this in mind, you've got the soft left on the table, the hard left on the table, you've got potential military come down. Kennedy then takes Bobby Kennedy's advice and what they decide to do is they reply, so don't, they don't retaliate, but they reply to the first letter. They ignore the second letter. They reply to the soft letter and they say, yeah, that's fine. We won't invade Cuba if you take your missiles out. And they ignore the demand, the demand for Turkey. And Kennedy sends Bobby Kennedy, his brother, over to the Soviet ambassador to try and negotiate that deal. And they await Khrushchev's response. And thankfully, on the 28th, that's when Khrushchev announces he is going to pull missiles out. Khrushchev announces the missiles will come out. Goes out on Radio Moscow and the UN get to inspect the um, removal of the missiles from Cuba. They, they make sure they're on the decks of the ship so they can count each one going home. So that's probably a bit of a humiliation. Question mark for Khrushchev. Does it look like he gets anything for it? Probably not, because the deal they do is in secret that the Americans will remove their obsolete Jupiter missiles from Turkey, but the public don't get to know about that. The Russians aren't allowed to tell people. So make sure with the Cuban Missile Crisis, bringing it to an end, that you can talk about the consequences. You can talk about who won. Castro certainly is extremely annoyed. Who had a victory? How well did they, did they score? The aftermath of it, in 63, you have a hotline set up to improve between the Kremlin and the White House, to improve uh, communication between the two powers. You also have a partial nuclear test ban treaty. Test ban. Um, but in 64, Khrushchev is ousted by a coup in Russia because perhaps he didn't appear strong enough. So, um, whereas you've got Kennedy travelling to um, West Berlin for his famous speech to tell everyone he's a donut in 1963 and being welcomed as an absolute hero of the free world. Make sure you can tell me who won that Cuban Missile Crisis.